Thank you very much. Welcome to the Lincoln Home. This is Christmas in the 1860s with a little bit of 2020 COVID style thrown in. Um, I'm Susan Hake. I'm the curator here at the Lincoln Home and I'm joined today by Ranger Bryson. Hi there. And behind the camera we have Ranger Jasmine. So hello. <laughs> thanks to both of them as well for helping us. And also big thanks to um, the folks at the State Museum for helping us put this all together. So we're gonna be walking through the Lincoln home while it's decorated. We don't know exactly what the Lincolns did. This is gonna be more of um, what was typical at the time with a few special things that we do know the Lincolns did. We'll be sure to point those out as well. Now to make things a little easier to understand, I'm gonna be taking my mask off as will Ranger Bryson because we will be in separate rooms. So don't panic, we are still being very safe as, <laughs> and so just so, to make it easier for you to hear. So let's get started. We're gonna go into the parlors first. Obviously here in the parlors, these are the, the most formal rooms in the house. They were, um, especially decorated by Mary to impress um, anybody, not just at Christmas, but uh, anytime anybody came to visit, of course, these are the, the rooms that you would come into first. So for Christmas, we've added um, some garland over the windows and over a couple of our special um, prints. Those are, of course, George and Martha Washington. And um, one, of our, one of my favorite questions we get is, were the Lincolns and the Washingtons friends? No, um, <laughs> but they were people that Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln greatly admired. So that was a fashion at the time. You would put people that you admired because you couldn't get photographs of yourself or your family in formats that large. So you would have prints of people that you would particularly admire. We've also got some garland on the mantles, both in the front and in the back parlor, along with um, strands of cranberries, some red berries, holly branches, et cetera, uh, just to make it a little more festive. And then we also have one of our favorite things is the forced bulb amaryllis plant. This was a very popular pastime for ladies. Um, they would particularly take so, like spring bulbs, narcissus, tulips, um, amaryllis, and they would force them to bloom right around Christmas. Don't look too closely, it is artificial. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. so here in the parlor for Christmas, perhaps on a day like today, um, maybe one of the la neighborhood ladies would come to call on Mrs. Lincoln. You'd come in the front door, um, met by the hired girl, usually, and ushered in here where Mrs. Lincoln would be greeting you. Um, you might leave your, your um, calling card in the calling card dish if Mrs. Lincoln wasn't available at that moment, which is over here. some of our neighbors in there and you'll notice behind it we've got one of those new fangled poinsettia plants poinsettias were available at the time they were a fairly new phenomenon they had been quote unquote discovered by general poinsett while in mexico in the 1840s and brought to the u.s so that would have been a very stylish addition to have to your christmas decorations As we go into the back parlor, you'll see we've got a few more poinsettias, but we also have a desk set up for Mr. Lincoln's to do, for him to do correspondence. There are records of Mr. Lincoln writing letters and working on speeches on December 24th, on December 26th. Now there's nothing on December 25th, but yes, he definitely was working up to the Christmas holidays. And then the week following, not so much on New Year's though. New Year's Day was also a day of celebration. So that's kind of um, typical of the period. Christmas Day was definitely more of a family, a personal holiday, a religious holiday. Usually church was involved, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day a lot of times. But New Year's Day was definitely a day to celebrate. Um, that's when a lot of the festivities happen and we'll talk more about some of the things that happened on New Year's Day. Um, but for now, um, are there questions before we go on? Are 
There's one question about the plants being, how would they force them to grow? Okay. Um, actually, this was something that would be, um, you can still do it. Um, you basically find a way to um, put the ball, you put the balls in, in a pot and you do an alternating round of chilling them and then warming them up. So they might be outside for a good part of the fall and they would get kind of that chill. Hopefully you'd have maybe a, a good frost in the process. Then you bring them in maybe two, three weeks before Christmas or before whatever date you'd like to have them forced, kind of tricking them or forcing them into thinking it's now spring and they will start to grow. And if you time it right, then you get beautiful bulbs like that. Okay. We have a couple more questions. Okay. So Donna asks, are there pocket doors to separate the spaces you are showing now? There are not. They're actually folding doors. And I'll have Jasmine follow me around. Now, if you want to take a look. Sorry, let me put my gloves on. There's one door. Then on the other side, you can see there is another one. So yes, they're folding doors, they're not pocket doors. These are original doors. These were the ones that the Lincolns had installed in 1856 when they created this double parlor. Before that, this had been a bedroom back here, but then when they added the full second story, they were able to move the bedrooms upstairs and Mary got a big double parlor, which is what she, I'm sure, had always wanted. Next question mm -hmm. asks, did the Lincolns celebrate the 12 days of Christmas? um they may have we don't know for sure um they didn't leave any records that they did something specific each day um but there were certainly festival uh activities going on there were balls there were gatherings um people would have each other over for in their homes the governor always threw a big dance at some point usually right around new year's so they probably were celebrating during those 12 days just not necessarily specific to each day the next question we have from multiple people are about a Christmas tree. Like, did they have one? When was the Christmas tree introduced? Maybe explaining, you know, why we don't see one right now. Okay. Um, we don't think they had a Christmas tree. Christmas trees were around. They did know about them. Um, they were first popularized in America through Godey's Ladies Book, which was the magazine for ladies to get. Um, in 1850, they had a print of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert and several of their small children standing around a table with a what we would now call a feather tree, a very German tradition, um, where it's just the, the lines of feathers and in, in layers and concentric circles. Um, so definitely knew about Christmas trees. Uh, if you weren't a German immigrant, it wasn't so much a tradition that you were familiar with to have in your own home. Um, so we don't think the Lincolns had one. There's no mention that they did, but there's no mentions that they didn't either. Um, however, First Presbyterian Church, which Mary was a member of, did have a huge Christmas tree. It was large enough that they actually advertised in the newspaper um, and said, you know, bring the children and they'll receive a gift off the tree. And those would have been books or balls or hoops and sticks or maybe some marbles, dolls for girls, things like that, that would have been given out then after the service. So you won't see a Christmas tree in this house because we just don't think they had one. Okay. Well, we have a lot, we have a lot of questions. Oh, okay. Um, so we'll, <laughs> we'll keep on coming. Um, but yeah, just anticipate a lot, Susan. Uh, so people are asking about, um, you know, Christmas gifts and Christmas cards. Is that, are those you know, did they send or receive either of those? We'll be talking about Christmas gifts when we go into the sitting room. Christmas cards were not popular at the time. Um, there were a couple that I think people had sent that I think still exist actually, but the really big um, development of Christmas cards wasn't until the late 1800s and early 1900s when people really started sending them. Um, Sarah suggested that we are going to uh, put a hold on the questions for now, but we will answer uh, more questions, you know, as we go along. Some of your questions might be answered throughout the tour, right? but we'll definitely check in at the end to make sure everyone's questions get answered if they don't in the process. So wonderful. Keep on All right. Well, one of the big things that about Christmas back then and still today, of course, is the food. And Mary Lincoln was um, 
particularly known for her wonderful dishes that she would serve at parties. So let's go in and talk to Bryson. He'll tell you all about the food. So here we find ourselves in Mrs. Lincoln's dining room, something she definitely would have taken pride in as for many of, you, of the first years in this house, this dining room was a present. Through this doorway is the kitchen and they were one big room or an eating kitchen. So when Mrs. Lincoln finally got her separate and enclosed dining room, she would have been very pleased with it. Sitting down to a freshly cooked meal with your family is one of the greatest joys of the holiday season. And we believe that the Lincolns would have enjoyed this tradition as well. Now you can see quite a spread here. At that time, the Lincolns would have had a Christmas meal, definitely. They had to eat that night for sure. But the bigger meal would have been for New Year's Day. It would have been a spread very much like this, set up buffet style, as various visitors would have come into the home to check things out and try some of Mrs. Lincoln's culinary dishes. The menu that you see here is based from some suggested menus that we find in cookbooks that Mrs. Lincoln had, or we knew that she had, including Eliza Leslie's uh, directions for cookery in its various branches, as well as a menu from a New Year's meal that was held at the White House during the Lincoln presidency, various traditions of the time, and then also the Lincoln's financial records, so we see what they're buying from stores. Here we see roast beef. We have roasted chicken, Cornish game hen, ham, biscuits, asparagus, carrots, peas, pickles, mashed potatoes, and gravy, and one of my personal favorites, fresh oysters shipped up from New Orleans. And then for all of you folks with a sweet tooth out here, let's go to the masterpiece, the dessert table. Here we see pumpkin pie. We see a Yule log, macaroon pyramid fruits, nuts, and of course, Mrs. Lincoln's famous white almond cake, resting on her original glass cake stand. And I am so sorry, folks, all of this food is fake, otherwise I'd be digging in. And unique artifacts in here include these two chairs and the table, which are original, which means that the Lincolns would have sat down together for more than just their holiday meals, but for most of their meals. Now let's talk about this big, beautiful piece in the center. That is an orange pyramid, and that's going to be decorative. We see oranges, and they're decorated with cloves and star anise. We see cinnamon, uh, cinnamon sticks. There's also uh, bayberry, kumquats, and other various herbs. So this item would be extremely fragrant, and it would be held together with kind of a glue made from sugar water and also toothpicks. But one can imagine that something as fragile as, as this might not have made it all the way through the holiday season with rambunctious boys running around as well as various cats and Fido the dog as well. Are there any questions for me here in this room? Um, even though you kind of covered some of the food, there was a question if they had turkey for Christmas dinner. So we actually know uh, that from various remains found in the rubbish pit and also in the Lincoln's privy uh, that there were bones from turkey. So they would have eaten them, but we don't know for sure if they would have actually had them for this particular meal, Christmas or New Year's. But we do know that the Lincolns did consume turkeys. So that's something that they would eat uh, and maybe had with this meal, but maybe not. Uh, as we see that they're getting these oysters shipped all the way from New Orleans, it's perhaps maybe about a little bit fancier dishes or things that you don't normally eat to make it a little more special. Good question. How about, was the food expensive and did Mr. Lincoln ever help cook? <laughs> We, uh, we don't necessarily see any of that, and uh, based on things that I've read and what we know about them, uh, it's likely Mrs. Lincoln would rather him not be in her way as she's cooking. And when we see the kitchen in a little bit, we'll see that it's kind of cramped quarters, so most likely it's going to be Mrs. Lincoln and then the hired girl who would likely help uh, cook the meal. As we know, to make a spread like this for our families takes a lot of effort and some time as well. Uh, very good question. Okay. Um and I don't know if you will be able to answer this or maybe Susan. We have a question, several questions out if they celebrated Advent. That I don't know. Susan, Susan, do you know Susan thinks said? that they did not. Not specifically. Not mm -hmm. specifically. Okay. Good question. Um, and then you've mentioned New Year's briefly. 
briefly. Someone wanted to hear a little bit more about how they might have celebrated New Year's. All right, so that's what I'm going to let Susan handle. Uh, <laughs> but I will say this before you head in there. After having a delicious meal with the family, they would then retire to their sitting room to hang out and uh, perhaps read out loud, play with toys, things like that. And I invite you all this way to check that out with Susan. All right, well, this is the informal side of the house. This is where the Lincolns would relax after dinner, as Bryson was saying. But this is also most likely where they would have celebrated presents. And we know that Lincoln liked to get on the floor and wrestle with his boys. And so this is a room where you could be messy. Um, so we've got a couple of things that we think may have been gifts or would have been appropriate for gifts um, for a family. We've got a chess set. We know Mr. Lincoln played chess. We've actually found a piece of a pawn. We were able to get the, the uh, type of chess set from that much of a pawn found in the backyard. This is called barley corn. This is a very popular style of chess set in um, the 1850s. It was from Germany. We also have everyone's favorite, the stereoscope. For those of you who are fond of uh, Viewmasters, you know, whoops. That was good. You know um, what this does? This creates a three-dimensional image when you look through the eye holes. This is actually an original Lincoln piece. So this is something that the boys would have enjoyed, probably the envy of the neighborhood too, that, that they had this piece. This is a little bit more of an expensive piece to have. We also have some things on the floor um, that belong to the boys. This includes um, some wooden toys, like carved wooden animals to play with, uh, some books, a hoop to play hoop and stick, slide whistle, some tin soldiers, and then you might be wondering what are those red things down there? They look kind of like dynamite. They kind of are. They are actually firecrackers based on a, a patented design from the 1850s. And firecrackers would have been used on Christmas Day and New Year's Day especially when you wanted to make a lot of noise and celebrate the season. Um, and it, there are lots of, of uh, mentions in newspapers of men and boys being outside shooting off firecrackers and shooting guns and making all kinds of noise, especially on New Year's Day. So that was something I'm sure that the Lincoln boys enjoyed participating in. You also, you'll notice there's a stocking on this floor, but this part of the floor, but we still have one stocking up on the mantel. And if you look closely, you can see there's nail holes along this mantle. And we think that was where the Lincoln boys would hang their stockings every year, because there's a lot of them and they go all the way across. So that seems like a logical thing um, that they would have hung their stockings up to be filled, of course, by St. Nick or Santa Claus, as he was being called by then. Just kind of a a neat little personal part of the family's history here at the house. So while we're in here, um, this would have, like I said, this would have been the messy room. This is where they could have torn open their presents, started playing with them. Maybe, you know, that there was a ball for Fido to play with. And of course, you know, the cats would have enjoyed playing with the ribbons and the wrapping paper, um, just like they do now. Cats haven't changed that much in, in 160 years. Um, but books, definitely a popular thing for younger boys and, and older boys. Also very popular for the adults to get, um, as well as a lot of the different toys and things like that. If there had been a tree, this is probably the room it would have been in, not the parlors. The parlors would have been too formal. So, um, but because like I said, we don't know if the Lincolns had a tree or not, we don't have a tree. Question. Yeah, we, they, we have quite a few. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> But I'm going to backtrack a little bit. It's kind of a continuation from the previous room. Mm -hmm. People ask about guests, dinner guests, or just Christmas guests in general. Okay. Um, like, is it common to have guests over for Christmas back then? Um, maybe not Christmas Day. Like I said, Christmas Day was very much a personal family gathering. Um, but definitely the days before and after. Um, you would have had maybe small gatherings, or you could have had large gatherings, although New Year's Day was the biggest gathering. Um, this is where ladies would stay at home. They would have these huge spreads of food, um, like the stuff that, that Bryson was pointing out. Um, they may have even had to, for Mary, she may have even had to remove the table into here where it could be a larger table. 
um, and you would have oysters and ice cream and salads and all sorts of different foods and then you'd also of course have to have eggnog and punch and when we talk about eggnog and punch we're not talking the child-friendly versions these were full bore highly alcoholic versions and then it was expected that the gentleman of your acquaintance would come to the door maybe go through the parlor meet some of the people there and then come through here and pick up some food and of course a glass of punch or eggnog so these these men that were making multiple calls a day probably weren't feeling too good by the end of the day. Um, and then you top that with all the noise from the firecrackers and, and the guns. And I feel kind of sorry for those gentlemen at the end of the day. <laughs> um, we also had some questions about Christmas music. Like, do we know what kind, like if they played any Christmas music or if we know any common, maybe popular mm -hmm. Christmas music of the time? Okay. Some of the, the, the Christmas music that, um, it's still around today are hymns that came out of uh, this time period. So that includes, um, it came upon a midnight clear, Silent Night was also had been written by this point. Um, Green Sleeves was available, of course, that was written by Henry VIII back in the 1500s. Um, so it was mostly the hymns. They weren't really what we consider the popular music at the time. Do you know if any of the Lincolns played music? Uh, not to our knowledge. The music, the, the Lincolns didn't seem to be a very musical family. They enjoyed it, but they didn't seem to play any instruments. Um, Mary would have learned as part of her schooling growing up, she would probably learn how to play the piano, but um, there's no evidence that she continued to play the piano after she was married, um, and none of the boys seemed to pick up any kind of instruments. Okay, and then a couple more. Are any of these items that we are seeing reproductions or are any of these, you know, original artifacts? Okay. Uh, we do have a few original artifacts. Like I said, the stereoscope over here on the table is an original Lincoln artifact, as are the chairs sitting there behind the, that table. Um, reproduction wise though, we have these lovely rockers, um, but they are based on the photo or the print you can see from a newspaper done in 1860. Um, and we do have one very practical item, actually two very practical items in here. They are Mary's sewing table and the mirror. Um, this room has the best light in the house. It has a western and a southern exposure. So it means Mary could be working on her sewing with the best light she could find. And there was always a lot of sewing to do. And then the mirror helped reflect any kind of light that would have been in the room as well. Okay, and final, the last question for now. Mm -hmm. Again, we'll get to everyone's questions um, that we haven't answered yet at the end. What were the names of the pets? Oh, okay. Well, um, by 1860, they had a dog named Fido. He was a yellow mutt. Um, we do have some photographs of him. He was left behind here in Springfield because the Lincolns didn't think he would do so well on the train journey to Washington. They also had lots and lots and lots of cats. Um, Mr. Lincoln had a fondness for cats that Mary even noted in a letter, she called him his hobby. Um, we know two of them were named Jane and Susan, but other than that, we don't know. Probably Kitty, a lot of Kitty, um, but the, beyond that, we don't know. All right, well, we're gonna go upstairs. Bryson's gonna meet you at the top of the stairs and he's gonna talk a little bit more about Robert and what a young man of 17 would get as a gift instead of toys. Oh, we're going up the stairs. So this is the Lincoln's guest room. And as you can see, as Jasmine will look around for you, it is quite a grand room. But of course you would want to impress your guests. And as Susan said, folks didn't quite travel quite as much as they do today. It was quite an ordeal to travel that far. And if you did go somewhere, you would stay for a while. But I'm sure the Lincoln's had some guests, uh, otherwise they wouldn't have a guest room. But after he left for college, this would be Robert Lincoln's room when he would come back to visit for the holidays. And we like to represent that with uh, some decorations up here. And here we see what would likely be a great gift for college aged Robert. We know that he became quite a dapper gentleman. So we see this beautiful cane or walking stick as well as Young Men's Magazine, which you might call the GQ of the day. 
So he would get some reading material that would talk about what young men were doing at the time, fashions and things like that, as well as we see this fashionable walking stick. Now, a unique artifact that we have in here um, is over here in the corner, and it's one of my personal favorites, and that is Lincoln's original fainting couch. But what we see on top of that is a shawl that was owned and worn by Mary Todd Lincoln, and that's something that we typically only put out during uh, periods of the year that have lower lights, aka the winter. So although it's technically not a holiday decoration, that's typically when we bring it out. So this was the Lincoln's guest room. Uh, as you folks leave this room, you will see a little nook at the top of the staircase. And we believe that to have been a sewing nook. And we believe that because during the big restoration, we found all sorts of sewing paraphernalia, buttons, pieces of thread, needles, and such that had fallen through the floorboards. So we know someone was doing a lot of sewing in this area. In the summertime, there is excellent light here. You can see even now in the darkness of winter, there's still a fair amount of light that comes in here. You can also see the intersection from the window as well. So it's likely Mrs. Lincoln was doing some of her sewing here as well. Any questions about the guest room? About the guest room, hold on. Yeah, not about the guest room. Um, we did have some questions about um, the wallpaper and carpets, whether they're reproductions. So all of the wallpaper and carpets that you'll see in the house today are reproductions. They're made from the same material in the same way, so they have the same look, texture, and feel, even though we're not supposed to touch them. Uh, the carpets are made on antique looms, uh, which is really pretty neat. And they are based off of uh, information that we found, items that we found. And when you head into the master bedroom suite, you will see wallpaper that is based directly upon wallpaper that you found on the walls, which is really pretty. And I invite you all to check that out. <laughs> okay, this is Mr. Lincoln's bedroom. And don't adjust your screens. That wallpaper really is that loud and that busy and that blue. So <laughs> that is the original pattern, the original colors of the wallpaper that Mr. Lincoln woke up to every morning for about five and a half years before they left for Washington. Um, it is a French import, but before you think, wow, that's pretty impressive, Mary actually went to one of the stores downtown and was able to order it out of a, a catalog, just like you do now. Um, so it is, it is a nicer wallpaper, but it's not, you know, anything particularly outrageous that she was able to get. This is just something that was available. So, um, but Mary did like all things French. She learned how to speak French and, and wrote it as well fluently while she was in school. Um, and just as a reminder, Mary did have about 12 years of education. Mr. Lincoln had less than one, but they both loved to read and both continued to educate themselves throughout their life. So, but we see little touch, touches of Mary's French influence throughout the house. So this is one of those. So in Mr. Lincoln's bedroom, he would have been meeting with clients. Like I said, he worked actually on the 24th and up through the, the 26th to the 31st and onward. Um, so this room was a little bit fancier. Um, he probably would have had to keep it cleaned up a little bit more so than maybe a normal bedroom would be. Um, and yes, there are there is a separate room for Mary, probably more of a dressing room. And we'll go through there in a few minutes. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is kind of the master bedroom. Now in here for Mr. Lincoln, we've decided that this year he's going to get a comb. For those of you who are familiar with his wild Republican hair portrait, I'm sure Mary would have been delighted to give him a comb as much as possible. Although I don't know that she would have gotten to use it a whole lot. And then we also gave him a book. Like I said, books were very popular gifts. They um, were appropriate for any age, any interest. Um, this particular one is a title that Mr. Lincoln did own. This is not his actual book, but this is a, a title of one that he owned. And it's called Lost and Found or Life Among the Poor. By Samuel Halliday. And Mr. Lincoln had gone to New York to the Five Points area. And if you're familiar with the movie Gangs of New York, that was set in the Five Points area. And he visited with Dr. Halliday, who was the court or the director of an orphanage there. Um, enjoyed his visit, was very moved by the children's plight. So then Dr. Halliday sent him a copy of his book later on, 
Mrs. Lincoln wrote uh, in December of, of 1860, she wrote back to him thanking him for the book and said she'd shared the book with several people. So we were able to get another copy of it and um, have it here for Mr. Lincoln's present. And say, while we're talking about Mr. Lincoln and some original items, we do have his original desk behind me. This desk was something, <laughs> and we have an alarm. This desk was something that um, he used, according to the um, research that we have on it, this is a desk he used when he first set up his own law office. Now, he probably needed a larger one fairly quickly after that because he was very busy, but this is his first one. Do we have questions? Um, we have a question about how old is the house? The house was built in 1839. Um, so last year we celebrated its 170, wait, am I doing my math? Oh, history majors in math. Anyway, so yeah, it's 170 years, it's 171 years old now. Um, but the second floor wasn't added until 1855. Um, the Lincolns, when the Lincolns moved in, it was a kind of a T-shaped house. So if you can imagine the front of the house and then the kitchen wing off the back, they later added on a bedroom downstairs and then finally added a full second floor from 1856, 55 to 56. And that's when they got these five bedrooms, they were able to create the double parlor and then the split the kitchen up into the kitchen and dining room. Another question is if we know other than Christmas and New Year's, did the Lincoln celebrate any other kind of winter holidays such as Hanukkah? Not that we've ever heard. Um, they knew a lot of, of people with a lot of different ethnic backgrounds, so they may have actually gone to other people's houses, maybe celebrated Hanukkah with some friends that were here. Um, there were African Americans in the neighborhood who may have brought some of their traditions up from the South. Um, there were German people, Irish people, uh, Portuguese, uh, all different uh, nationalities were in the neighborhood and in Springfield. So they may have heard about some of the other activities and, and um, traditions. I don't know that they participated, though they didn't, they didn't leave any record of it. Um, and then kind of looking at, like, we've seen several fireplaces so far mm -hmm. in the house. Did they have coal or wood fires? These are all wood-fired fireplaces, and this one's actually a false fireplace. This was never actually a fireplace. It was always a stove. This is um, actually just kind of a front. It was a mantle that's it's made out of pine. It's actually painted though to look like oak, but it was never actually an open fireplace. It was always just a stove into the chimney. And then someone had a question out of the bed is, um, <laughs> of course, asking if Abraham Lincoln had a special bed. He did not. Uh, the bed, this is actually not Lincoln's bed. This is a, an antique from the time period. Um, his bed, as far as we can tell, burned in the Chicago fire. Um, it was sold when they left for Washington to the family who had moved into the house. And that family later moved to Chicago in 1869. And two years later, their house burned in the fire. So we assume that Lincoln's bed also did. Um, this is a big bed. Uh, Mr. Lincoln probably had an equally large bed, but um, not a special custom made one. It was, there were no standard sizes yet. Um, so it was just whatever you told either told the carpenter to make or what was available at the store. Um, and then we have a question about did he or did the family own this house or did they rent it? They owned the house. The Lincolns bought the house in 1844 for $1,500. It was $1,200 in cash and then they transferred a lot that they owned downtown um, that was worth about 300. And then they added the second floor for another $1,200. So they doubled the price and the size of the home at the same time. All right, we're going to walk through Mary's room real quickly. You can take a look. Um, one of the things that people seem to notice most of all is the dress on the bed. That dress is not Mary's. Um, it's actually too short for her. But kind of to connect with that idea, Mary's gift is actually a stack of fabric so she could make her own ball gown. It's purple, her favorite color. Like I said, we, we call this more of a, a dressing room or a, a master bedroom suite with the two rooms. Um, Mary and Abraham had very different schedules on a daily basis. Mr. Lincoln liked to stay up late. Mary would have to get up early and uh, start breakfast and get the boys off to school. So sometimes it was just practical for them to sleep in separate rooms. 
Mary also unfortunately suffered from migraines and in a house full of rambunctious boys, she really just needed a spot where she could come in here, shut the doors and keep it quiet and dark. So um, this is probably more just a private office dressing room for her. We do have a couple of interesting things here that did belong to Mary. We have a chest of drawers back here in the corner that she most likely brought with her from Kentucky at some point. It's one of our oldest pieces. It's from the 18 teens or early 1820s. And then everybody's favorite over here next to Jasmine is Mary Lincoln's commode. Yes, indeed. It's mahogany, um, so it's pretty fancy. <laughs> and it's on wheels. I, and I don't know why it's on wheels, but it's on wheels. <laughs> Are there questions? If not, we'll head, we can head into the back of the, the back hall anyway, but we can take questions. Let me check the chat. <laughs> I'm sure I've missed some, but yeah. You'll notice in the back hallway, considerably different. Plain white walls probably would have been a bare floor or maybe a rag rug back here because nobody was expected to be back here. This was just for the boys, which is over here on the right, their room. Originally Robert's room when he first, when they first added the second floor. But uh, when he went away to school, then his younger brothers took over. So we've got a couple of cookies for the boys because I think they may have had as big a sweet tooth as their mother. We know that Mary really enjoyed sweets. And some toys that they would have gotten maybe some other time. Marbles especially. We found several of those marbles in the backyard of Lincoln Home. We also have found them everywhere else we've ever done archaeology within the neighborhood. So marbles was clearly a popular game for our neighborhood. Speaking of the boys and toys, are any, other, are any of these toys real or are they all also reproductions? Uh, there are a lot of antiques. Like I said, some of the marbles in that container actually did belong to the Lincoln, or found in the Lincoln home backyard. Um, but no, the rest of the toys did not survive the Lincoln boys' childhood. Um, I think one of the people, uh, our audience members, had a question about this hoop. Um, what they asked, what, what is it for? Okay, uh, the hoop, and there were some more hoops downstairs as Christmas gifts. That was a game um, of skill, basically. You had to, you had a stick to help you balance the hoop, and then you had to roll the hoop as far as you possibly could um, without it toppling over. So it was a challenge, and it was something unusual for the time. It was something that both boys and girls could play. A lot of times the games and toys were kind of segregated, but hoop and stick was a game that was okay for boys and girls to play. Is the coverlet original? It is actually an antique. It's one of the few antiques we have. And if you look in the corner, I will, and I'll pull it out so you can see it more clearly. This one's actually dated 1853. Kind of see it there. This is called the spread eagle pattern. You can see how they got that name. So I want to ask, is this the room that our son passed away in? No, Eddie died actually downstairs. They had the bedroom downstairs when it was, was now the back parlor. Um, but that was the Lincoln's bed, master bedroom at the time. So that's where Eddie did pass away. Um, this room wasn't built yet when he was alive. So this was just, Robert had it first, then Willie and Ted. So, all right, let's go to the hired girls room. I'll let Jasmine go first. We've actually been able to find out quite a bit about the various hired girls that the Lincolns had. Um, we've been able to track 17 of them in 17 years. And that was pretty typical at the time. Um, they were, most of them were young girls, 13 to 15 years old. A lot of them were recent immigrants, either Irish or Portuguese. Um, we did have a couple of free women of color that worked here. Um, they didn't necessarily live here. They had their own homes um, because a lot of them had already been married and had children of their own. 
Um, the way we have the room set up now, though, is for one of those 13 to 15 year olds. Um, she would have actually been able to have her own bed, her own space, which she may not have had at home. Um, she would have had, she would have worked probably six to six and a half days a week. Average price, uh, average salary at the time was about a dollar and a half a week, but she did get room and board. Um, if she was underage, not 18, and not married, her money would have gone straight to her father, though. That's, she was earning the money, not for herself, but for her family. Um, in 1860, which is the time we, we talk about here and mostly um, in the Lincoln home, on the 1860 census, there is an M. Johnson who's listed on the census as living here at the Lincoln home. So we chose her first name to be Maria. And she's receiving a handkerchief this year, which is actually based on one of the few things we do know about the Lincolns. In, uh, on December 24th, 1860, Mr. Lincoln is recorded at one of the stores downtown as having bought um, four children's silk handkerchiefs, four linen handkerchiefs, and three gentlemen's handkerchiefs. So we think those were probably Christmas gifts, and so the hired girl has received one for Christmas this year. Um, since we kind of have a view of the backyard from this room, we did have a question about um, the Lincoln's backyard. Was it considered pretty big? Is this the same rough size as their backyard when they lived here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, each lot in this particular subdivision was originally 40 feet wide by 152 feet long. Now, when Mr. Lincoln bought the house, um, it was discovered that actually the gentleman he bought the house from had built over the lot line. So Mr. Lincoln got an extra 10 feet. So his lot is actually 50 by 152. It still is that now. Um, it is 50 feet by 152. Like I said that was the standard lot for Springfield. It was a 40, the 40 by 152 was a standard lot size. Not particularly large or small, just kind of average. <laughs> And did any of Mary's relatives ever visit the Lincolns when they lived here? Yes, yes. The, Mary had three sisters living here in Springfield when they were here. Um, her two older sisters, Elizabeth and Frances, and then her younger sister, Anne, all lived within about six blocks of each other. Um, Elizabeth had married the son of the territorial governor and was um, definitely in the high society of Springfield. Uh, her husband was a lawyer, so that's how Mr. Edwards, his name was Ninian Edwards, and Mr. Lincoln for, frequently worked together. And so then eventually Mr. Edwards invited Mr. Lincoln to a party at their home where conveniently Mary Todd was up visiting her sister, her older sister from Lexington, Kentucky. And the legend is that Mr. Lincoln asked Miss Todd, um, he said, I want to dance with you in the worst way. And Mary Lincoln later said he did. He wasn't particularly light on his feet. Um, but uh, Mary's second older sister was Frances. She was married to a doctor, William Wallace. He helped deliver some of the Lincoln boys. In fact, their third son, William Wallace Lincoln, is named for uh, Mary's brother-in-law. And then her younger sister, Anne, was married to a storekeeper, Clark Smith. He had a very successful store downtown that the Lincolns frequently patronized. So there was a lot of mingling and, and um, back and forth. They were all kind of not only neighbors, but they were also in the same kind of society together. So yes, they would have seen each other frequently and had each other at their homes. I, we have a question though. I'm not exactly sure what it is, Okay. Um, but they said, I noticed what looks like courier and ice on the walls. Oh, the print on the back wall. Oh, okay. Some of these are courier and ice. Some of them are other prints, uh, other companies that would have published similar looking things. Um, one of the interesting things about this one, though, that is a little boy. It looks like a girl with the long curly hair, but that is a young young boy praying. It's a very it's a very good print to have here. Um, not only would Mary Lincoln have to show the higher, the younger hired girls how to run a household and how to cook and clean and take care of children, but she was also then responsible for her spiritual upbringing as well. All right, we're going to send Jasmine down the stairs, try to be careful with that, and we'll see Bryson in the kitchen. All right, so welcome everyone to the kitchen. Now, as we've 
been through this house today. It's a fairly large home, but by today's standard, this might be considered a pretty small kitchen. But nevertheless, Mrs. Lincoln would teach herself how to cook in this kitchen and become one of Springfield's more renowned cooks. I would like to draw your attention to this stove as it is one of the original items in this room. And it is called the Royal Oak, which is the model. Uh, and if Jasmine pans over, you'll see uh, embossed in the actual cast iron of the stove, you'll see the name Royal Oak, the uh, patented in 1856. We also see that it is the number nine. Uh, which is the size of the model. And the number nine was the largest size of this particular model. It was manufactured by the Jewett and Root Company uh, based out of New York. This was not an inexpensive stove. This was very nice. And this would be quite an upgrade for Mrs. Lincoln. It has four burners, as it were, and also two baking bays as well. So Mrs. Lincoln could produce a fair amount of food on this cast iron wood burning stove. But I'd like for all of you to take a second. Think about that huge spread that we saw in the dining room. Then I want you to think about when you've hosted Thanksgiving. And of course, this year doesn't count. Everything was a little bit smaller this year. But in a normal year, when you're cooking for Thanksgiving, all the family is coming. Think about the time that's involved with that, the coordination that's involved with that. Have you ever had to perhaps borrow a neighbor's oven in order to get all the food cooked in time for one of your Thanksgivings or holiday meals? Think of all that food that Mrs. Lincoln would have prepared in this little room and with this stove and how much time and effort she would have had to have put into that. The, the other original artifact in this room, which is pretty neat, is rocking chair. And we can imagine Mrs. Lincoln sitting in that rocker, gently rocking, perhaps reading some poetry or one of her favorite books as she waited for her pies or bread or biscuits or various other baked goods to finish cooking in that beautiful stove. Something unique about this room, also directly correlated to its size, is that it is almost the exact same size as the one room log cabin that Abraham Lincoln was born and raised in. Dirt floors, logs for walls, one room, every purpose, every function. Anywhere from six to 13 people living in this one room. Imagine you and your family living in this one room. And Abraham Lincoln makes it all the way from something like that to something like this. This is a pretty nice house. On his way to an even bigger, even nicer one. The White House. It takes a special person to be able to do that. But if we've gone through this house today, we've seen a home. We've seen that a family lived here, that they did all the normal things, the everyday things, just like we do. And today, we've also gotten to see how they decorated and celebrated the holidays, just like us. So when we think of Abraham Lincoln, we tend to think of a man like no other. But today, you've seen a home like yours and mine. On behalf of the National Park Service, I want to thank all of you for joining us today and taking the time to take a tour of the home with us. I want to thank the Illinois State Museum for all of their help in uh, putting this on. And we've got Susan in the room here, so I want to take the opportunity to open up for general questions about anything you've seen in the home, anything you want to ask of us, fire away. Okay, um, well, we're going to, you know, backtrack to some of the questions we get, didn't get to. One of the ones we had a little earlier on in the tour was what was found in the rubbish heap? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we found a lot of interesting things. We found, as Bryce had mentioned, we found a lot of bones. Um, so we knew that they were eating sirloin steak and turkey and chicken and pork. Very typical Midwestern kind of diet. Um, we found broken pieces of china and glassware that enabled us to actually get some of those pieces, similar enough pieces to um, have those in the house, some of the dishes that we have. Um, we found seeds from various, a lot of berry, different berries, gooseberries and raspberries and strawberries, so we know they were eating those as well. Um, so yeah, the rubbish pits are a great source of, of information. Okay, um, I had a question about the stove here. Mm -hmm. Is it made of metal or what is the material it is made out of? It is cast iron. So this thing is incredibly heavy 
and would definitely be built to last. Uh, as we can see, it's still here in, in magnificent shape. Excellent question. Um, we have a couple of questions about the hired girls. Mm -hmm. um, what would Mrs. Lincoln do for the spiritual upbringing of the hired girls? Uh, were the girls who worked for them allowed to visit their families? Yes, yes. Um, so first, the first question was, um, how, did, how did the lady of the house um, coordinate spiritual upbringing? Um, that would have included um, maybe giving them a prayer book that they could use, uh, perhaps even having to teach them to read so they could use, they could use the prayer book or the Bible. Um, a lot of times the, the lady of the house would give the hired girl the morning off or the afternoon off so she could attend services. Um, that was usually also the time then that the girl could go home and visit her family as well. So uh, it wasn't necessarily um, a direct spiritual teachings, but certainly in, encouraged and supported them. And then yes, like I said, they were able to go home and visit their family, usually a day or a half day, depending on what the setup was. Um, what's a question is, what's that door behind your your bracelet over there. All right, so we, we got some more going on, but it might get a little loud, but we're going to show you here. This is the back porch. So you see Mrs. Lincoln would have had her firewood box. She could hang big pots and pans and things on the wall right here. And then through that door would have been uh, where she would have kept her dry goods. So it's kind of like a little storage closet. Today we keep random things in there, but she could keep her dry goods and other thin canned goods and things like that right in there, and it would just be a hop, skip, and a jump away from the kitchen. Okay, another thing about the kitchen, is there a sink for washing up? Kind of. Let's <laughs> check it out. So this is what's called a dry sink. And so with the dry sink, what it would normally be on at any given time if they weren't actually using the sink is it would provide some counter space. We've noticed that there is not a lot of counter space here. So this would have been down. And you get the work area. But when you needed to wash something, fruits, vegetables, dishes, what have you, Mrs. Lincoln or the hired girl would take a bucket. They would go out to the store, out to the water pump, pump that bucket full, bring it in, dump it in, and repeat until the sink filled up. Then they could wash what they needed to wash and handle their business. And then they would have to drain. Now, say that we can't get it open. But this door right here opens up, you slide your bucket in, and there's a little spigot down there. Turn the spigot and you would drain the sink one bucket at a time. Kind of a pain, but certainly better than no sink. And so that's what this item was and would be very functional in a kitchen in that time period. Excellent question. Um, how about storage of milk and butter and more of those perishable items? Obviously there's no refrigerator in here. <laughs> and so do we have an idea of how they might have stored those? Um, some of the, the milk and butter and the, the things that needed to be kept cool could be kept downstairs. There was a root cellar, the access is out this side. This is a, another porch area and then there's a door hatch that goes to the basement. Um, so they could have kept some of it there. Most of it though, you just, you used and you made that day. Um, the Lincolns had a, a milk cow, so they would milk the, they would milk the cow every day. So they would have fresh milk. Um, they would use the butter and the cream as it was created, basically. So a very little storage, very little cool storage was needed over the, the course of a regular day. Um, how much was, did, or did they sell the house when they left for DC? And how much is it worth today? If we know? <laughs> uh, they did not sell the house. They um, rented it to a gentleman here in town. He was the president of the railway, which is actually just a block and a half away. Um, he and his family moved in with the idea that they would um, stay here until the Lincolns came back. Um, that obviously did not happen. The Lincolns, Mr. Lincoln was assassinated. Mrs. Lincoln and her children kind of scattered a little bit for a while. Mrs. Lincoln eventually did come back, but she decided she couldn't live in this house. She just didn't feel like she could. So she moved in with her sister. They continued to rent the house even after Mary and the three of the Lincoln boys had died, leaving Robert the sole heir. Um, and in 1887, he deeded it, gave it to the state of Illinois for the cost of a whole dollar. Um, pretty good deal. As far as what it's worth today, uh, I have no idea. 
um, it's irreplaceable. So there's really no way to put a set price on it. Although I'm sure if there are realtors out there, um, it's a five bedroom, no bathroom house. So, you know, <laughs> see what you can do with that. <laughs> um, in your opinion, if Lincoln were alive today, would maybe your friends think to give him a Kindle for Christmas? Ooh, probably. Oh, um, he would love that. Yeah, the Lincolns really enjoyed the latest technology, evidenced by the stove, the stereoscope they gave the boys. These were the latest and greatest. Um, so yeah, I could see Kindle, I could see Xbox for the boys. Oh uh, yeah, they would have really enjoyed it. Laptops, smartphones, they would have had it all, I'm sure. <laughs> I made a clarification about the green dress we saw upstairs in Mary's room. Was that an original um, or an antique? It is an antique dress. Um, like I said, it's actually too short for Mary. Mary's about 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, um, that dress was actually made for a woman who's closer to about five feet tall. Um, it is an antique, and the reason it's still that vibrant green color was because the dye that made that green was made out of copper arsenic. So it's actually a very deadly artifact. Um, if a woman was wearing it and she maybe had a cut on her, her arm, and she was particularly sweaty day or something like that, the arsenic could get into her skin and eventually kill her. So it's it's quite the dress. <laughs> uh, we, we, even though we're not really, um, we're still in the house, but we had a question about, um, you know, were, there's, were there a place for cars or vehicles or, you know, if they had bikes, you know, where would they put those? Um, as far as we know, they did not have bikes. Um, there were versions of bikes available, but to our knowledge, the Lincoln Center had them. They did have um, a buggy, maybe even a, some sort of small wagon. Those would have been kept out in the barn and woodshed, which are out in the backyard. Let's, can we see uh, you can see a little bit through the window here. We can open up and you can step yeah. out. Okay, okay, so you can kind of see that building um, over there. Is let's go outside. Yeah, just a quick review of the outbuildings. The tall, two, the story and a half is the barn. That's where they would have kept the wagon, um, and as well as the horses. Then the, the lower building there in the middle is the woodshed. That would have been, again, storage, wood. And of course, the small building on the left is the outhouse. That's the pretty, the outhouse, whatever you want to call it. Get back where it's warm. <laughs> Do we know the names of the horses? Uh, we do on a couple of occasions. The last horses that the Lincolns had here, they were named Old Buff and Old Bob. Um, and Old Bob supposedly to distinguish him from young Bob Lincoln, their son, although I, can, I hope that there was able to distinguish between a horse and a child. Um, <laughs> uh, old Bob actually survived longer than Abraham Lincoln. He was a feature in Mr. Lincoln's um, funeral parade in 1865. So we even have pictures of old Bob. Okay, um, let's see, do we have any last questions? Mm -hmm. let's see, it looks like we're good. Um, it looks like we're good on questions from the okay. audience. Well, thank you so much for joining us as we walked through the Lincoln home and had a little bit of a holiday celebration. Uh, Mary always loved to entertain, so we think she would have enjoyed having all of you here in whatever way you could get here. Um, if you have any other questions or are interested, you can reach us. Um, we're going to send out some links to various activities, um, more information about Christmas, our Facebook page, our website. Um, so you feel free to follow up with that. And thank you again to the Illinois State Museum for helping us host this. So if you have any other questions, let us know or let Elizabeth and Sarah know in the State Museum. Thanks so much for coming. Bye. <laughs>